Chapter 18 of The Black Dwarf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Dwarf by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter 18. Last scene of all to close this strange, eventful history. As you like it. On the next morning, Mr. Ratcliffe presented Miss Vere with a letter from her father, of which the following is the tenor my dearest child the malice of a persecuting government will compel me for my own safety to retreat abroad and to remain for some time in foreign parts i do not ask you to accompany or follow me you will attend to my interest in your own more effectually by remaining where you are it is unnecessary to enter into a minute detail concerning the causes of the strange events which yesterday took place i think i have reason to complain of the usage i have received from sir edward Molly who is your nearest kinsman by the mother's side. But as he has declared you his heir, and is to put you in immediate possession of a large part of his fortune, I account it a full atonement. I am aware he has never forgiven the preference which your mother gave to my addresses, instead of complying with the terms of a sort of family compact which absurdly and tyrannically destined her to wed her deformed relative. The shock was even sufficient to unsettle his wits which indeed were never over well arranged, and I had, as the husband of his nearest kinswoman and heir, the delicate task of taking care of his person and property, until he was reinstated in the management of the latter by those who, no doubt, thought they were doing him justice, although if some parts of his subsequent conduct be examined, it will appear that he ought, for his own sake, to have been left under the influence of a mild and salutary restraint. In one particular, however, he showed a sense of the ties of blood, as well as of his own frailty. For while he sequestered himself closely from the world, under various names and disguises, and insisted on spreading a report of his own death, in which to gratify him I willingly acquiesced, he left at my disposal the rents of a great proportion of his estates, and especially all those which, having belonged to your mother, reverted to him as a male fief. In this he may have thought that he was acting with extreme generosity, while, in the opinion of all impartial men, he will only be considered as having fulfilled a natural obligation, seeing that, in justice if not in strict law, you must be considered as the heir of your mother, and I as your legal administrator. Instead, therefore, of considering myself as loaded with obligations to Sir Edward on this account, I think I had reason to complain that these remittances were only doled out to me at the pleasure of Mr. Ratcliffe, who, moreover, exacted from me mortgages over my paternal estate of Ellislaw for any sums which I required as an extra advance, and thus may be said to have insinuated himself into the absolute management and control of my property. Or, if all this seeming friendship was employed by Sir Edward for the purpose of obtaining a complete command of my affairs, and acquiring the power of ruining me at his pleasure, I feel myself, I must repeat, still less bound by the alleged obligation. About the autumn of last year, as I understand, either his own crazed imagination or the accomplishment of some such scheme as I have hinted, brought him down to this country. His alleged motive, it seems, was a desire of seeing a monument which he had directed to be raised in the chapel over the tomb of your mother. Mr. Ratcliffe, who at this time had done me the honor to make my house his own, had the complacence to introduce him secretly into the chapel. The consequence, as he informs me, was a frenzy of several hours, during which he fled into the neighboring moors in one of the wildest spots of which he chose, when he was somewhat recovered, to fix his mansion, and set up for a sort of country empiric, a character which, even in his best days, he was fond of assuming. It is remarkable that instead of informing me of these circumstances that I might have had the relative of my late wife taken care of as his calamitous condition required, Mr. Ratcliffe seems to have had such culpable indulgence for his irregular plans as to promise and even swear secrecy concerning them. He visited Sir Edward often and assisted in the fantastic task he had taken upon him of constructing a hermitage. Nothing they appear to have dreaded more than a discovery of their intercourse. The ground was open in every direction around, and a small subterranean cave, probably sepulchral, which their researches had detected near the great granite pillar, served to conceal Ratcliffe when any one approached his master. I think you will be of opinion, my love, that this secrecy must have some strong motive. 
It is also remarkable that while I thought my unhappy friend was residing among the monks of La Trappe, he should have been actually living for many months in this bizarre disguise within five miles of my house, and obtaining regular information of my most private movements either by Ratcliffe or through Westburn Flat or others, whom he had the means to bribe to any extent. He makes it a crime against me that I endeavoured to establish your marriage with Sir Frederick. I acted for the best. But if Sir Edward Molly thought otherwise, why did he not step manfully forward, express his own purpose of becoming a party to the settlements, and take that interest which he is entitled to claim in you as heir to his great property? Even now, though, your rash and eccentric relation is somewhat tardy in announcing his purpose, I am far from opposing my authority against his wishes, although the person he desires you to regard as your future husband be young Earnscliffe the very last whom I should have thought likely to be acceptable to him, considering a certain fatal event. But I give my free and hearty consent, providing the settlements are drawn in such an irrevocable form, as may secure my child from suffering by that state of dependence, and that sudden and causeless revocation of allowances, of which I have so much reason to complain. Of Sir Frederick Langley, I augur, you will hear no more. He is not likely to claim the hand of a dowerless maiden. I therefore commit you, my dear Isabella, to the wisdom of providence and to your own prudence, begging you to lose no time in securing those advantages which the fickleness of your kinsman has withdrawn from me to shower upon you. Mr. Radcliffe mentions Sir Edward's intention to settle a considerable sum upon me yearly for my maintenance in foreign parts, but this my heart is too proud to accept from him. I told him I had a dear child who, while in affluence herself, would never suffer me to be in poverty. I thought it right to intimate this to him pretty roundly, that whatever increase be settled upon you it may be calculated so as to cover this necessary and natural encumbrance. I shall willingly settle upon you the castle and manor of Ellislaw to show my parental affection, and disinterested zeal for promoting your settlement in life. The annual interest of debts charged on the estate somewhat exceeds the income, even after a reasonable rent has been put upon the mansion and mains. But as all the debts are in the person of Mr. Ratcliffe, as your kinsman's trustee, he will not be a troublesome creditor. And here I must make you aware that though I have to complain of Mr. Ratcliffe's conduct to me personally, I nevertheless believe him a just and upright man with whom you may safely consult on your affairs, not to mention that to cherish his good opinion will be the best way to retain that of your kinsman. Remember me to Marchie. I hope he will not be troubled on account of late matters. I will write more fully from the continent. Meanwhile, I rest, your loving father, Richard Vere. The above letter throws the only additional light which we have been able to procure upon the earlier part of our story. It was Hobby's opinion, and maybe that of most of our readers, that the recluse of Mucklestane Moor had but a kind of gleaming or twilight understanding, and that he had neither very clear views as to what he himself wanted, nor was apt to pursue his ends by the clearest and most direct means so that to seek the clue of his conduct was likened by Hobby to looking for a straight path through a common, over which there are a hundred devious tracks but not one distinct line of road. When Isabella had perused the letter, her first inquiry was after her father. He had left the castle, she was informed, early in the morning after a long interview with Mr. Ratcliffe, and was already far on his way to the next port, where he might expect to find shipping for the continent. Where was Sir Edward Molly? No one had seen the dwarf since the eventful scene of the preceding evening. Odd, if anything had befallen poor Elsie, said Hobby Elliot. I would rather I were harried o'er again. He immediately rode to his dwelling, and the remaining she-goat came bleeding to meet him, for her milking time was long past. The solitary was nowhere to be seen. His door, contrary to want, was open. His fire extinguished and the whole hut was left in the state which it exhibited on Isabella's visit to him. It was pretty clear that the means of conveyance which had brought the dwarf to Ellislaw on the preceding evening had removed him from it to some other place of abode. Hobby returned disconsolate to the castle. I am doubting we have lost Canny Elshie for good, and a— uh, You have indeed, said Ratcliffe, producing a paper which he put into Hobby's hands. But read that, and you will perceive you have been no loser by having known him. It was a short deed of gift, by which Sir Edward Molly, otherwise called Elshinder the Recluse, endowed Halbert, or Hobby Elliot, 
and Grace Armstrong in full property with a considerable sum borrowed by Elliot from him. Hobby's joy was mingled with feelings which brought tears down his rough cheeks. It's a queer thing, he said, but I cannot joy in the gear unless I ken the poor body was happy that gave it to me. Next to enjoying happiness ourselves, said Ratcliffe, is the consciousness of having bestowed it on others. Had all my master's benefits been conferred like the present, what a different return would they have produced? But the indiscriminate profusion that would glut avarice or supply prodigality neither does good nor is rewarded by gratitude. It is sowing the wind to reap the whirlwind. And that would be a light harsh, said Hobby. But with my young lady's leave, I would fain take down Elsie's skeps of bees and set them in Grace's bit flower yard at the Hewfoot. They shall ne'er be smeeket by ony o who's. And the poor goat, she would be neglected about a great town like this, and she could feed bonnily on our lily lee by the burnside, and the hounds would kin her in a day's time and never fash her, and Grace would milk her ilka mornin' wi' her ain hand, for Elshie's sake. For though he was thrawn and cankered in his converse, he liked it dumb creature's weal. Hobby's requests were readily granted, not without some wonder at the natural delicacy of feeling which pointed out to him this mode of displaying his gratitude. He was delighted when Ratcliffe informed him that his benefactor should not remain ignorant of the care which he took of his favorite. And mine be sure and tell him that Granny and the Tiddies, and Abuna, Grace and meself are weal and thriving, and that it's a his doin' that cannot but please him, mine would think. And Elliot at the family at Hewfoot were and continued to be as fortunate and happy as his undaunted honesty, tenderness, and gallantry so well merited. All bar between the marriage of Earnscliffe and Isabella was now removed, and the settlements which Ratcliffe produced on the part of Sir Edward Molly might have satisfied the cupidity of Ellislaw himself. But Miss Vere and Radcliffe thought it unnecessary to mention to Earnscliffe that one great motive of Sir Edward in thus loading the young pair with benefits was to expiate his having, many years before, shed the blood of his father in a hasty brawl. If it be true, as Ratcliffe asserted, that the dwarf's extreme misanthropy seemed to relax somewhat under the consciousness of having diffused happiness among so many, the recollection of this circumstance might probably be one of his chief motives for refusing obstinately ever to witness their state of contentment. Marischal hunted, shot, and drank claret. Tired of the country, went abroad, served three campaigns, came home, and married Lucy Ilderton. Years fled over the heads of Earnscliffe and his wife, and found and left them contented and happy. The scheming ambition of Sir Frederick Langley engaged him in the unfortunate insurrection of 1715. He was made prisoner at Preston in Lancashire with the Earl of Derwentwater and others. His defense and the dying speech which he made at his execution may be found in the state trials. Mr. Vere, supplied by his daughter with an ample income, continued to reside abroad, engaged deeply in the affair of Law's Bank during the regency of the Duke of Orléans and was at one time supposed to be immensely rich. But on the bursting of that famous bubble, he was so much chagrined at being again reduced to a moderate annuity, although he saw thousands of his companions in misfortune absolutely starving, that vexation of mind brought on a paralytic stroke, of which he died after lingering under its effects a few weeks. Willie of Westburn flat fled from the wrath of Hobby Elliot as his betters did from the pursuit of the law. His patriotism urged him to serve his country abroad, while his reluctance to leave his native soil pressed him rather to remain in the beloved island and collect purses, watches, and rings on the high roads at home. Fortunately for him the first impulse prevailed, and he joined the army under Marlborough, obtained a commission to which he was recommended by his services in collecting cattle for the commissariat, returned home after many years with some money, how come by heaven only knows, demolished the peel house at Westburn Flat and built in its stead a high, narrow onstead of three stories, with a chimney at each end, drank brandy with the neighbors whom in his younger days he had plundered, died in his bed and is recorded upon his tombstone at Kirkwhistle, still extant, as having played all the parts of a brave soldier, a discreet neighbor, and a sincere Christian. Mr. Ratcliffe recited usually with the family at Ellislaw but regularly every spring and autumn he absented himself for about a month. 
On the direction and purpose of his periodical journey he remained steadily silent, but it was well understood that he was then in attendance on his unfortunate patron. At length on his return from one of these visits his grave countenance and deep mourning dress announced to the Ellislaw family that their benefactor was no more. Sir Edward's death made no addition to their fortune, for he had divested himself of his property during his lifetime, and chiefly in their favor. Ratcliffe, his sole confidant, died at a good old age, but without ever naming the place to which his master had finally retired, or the manner of his death, or the place of his burial. It was supposed that on all these particulars his patron had enjoined him strict secrecy. The sudden disappearance of Elshie from his extraordinary hermitage corroborated the reports which the common people had spread concerning him. Many believed that having ventured to enter a consecrated building contrary to his paction with the evil one, he had been bodily carried off while on his return to his cottage. But most are of opinion that he only disappeared for a season, and continues to be seen from time to time among the hills and retaining according to custom a more vivid recollection of his wild and desperate language than of the benevolent tendency of most of his actions he is usually identified with the malignant demon called the man of the moor whose feats were quoted by mrs elliot to her grandsons and accordingly is generally represented as bewitching the sheep causing the ewes to keb that is to cast their lambs or seen loosening the impending wreath of snow to precipitate its weight on such as take shelter during the storm beneath the bank of a torrent or under the shelter of a deep glen in short the evils most dreaded and deprecated by the inhabitants of that pastoral country are ascribed to the agency of the black dwarf end of chapter eighteen recording by philip gould end of the black dwarf by sir walter scott